okay, now that you've got natural selection down and now that you've got speciation down, we're going to talk about how populations actually evolve. And here's the thing is that while one individual, um, can have natural selection act on it, one individual does not evolve. Okay, the smallest unit of evolution is a population. And remember, a population is just a group of the same species that lives in the same area that can interbreed. And so my example here is think back to your butterfly lab. Okay. Um, all of a sudden, in the middle of the lab, could a red dot turn blue? No, it couldn't turn blue, right? We can't just wish traits into being just because we want them to be right but what could happen is more blue dots survive to have blue babies and then the next generation had more blue dots right so that is our population evolving but an individual dot an individual butterfly couldn't just evolve in and of itself natural selection acted on it which meant that maybe it lived to reproduce or it didn't live to reproduce but that individual all of a sudden didn't just up and change its traits in the middle of its life. Okay. That's a big, important thing, big, important foundational piece about this whole concept. Um, so remember we've got like four conditions that have to be true for natural selection to happen, right? Variation exists in populations. That's number one. Number two, more babies are born that can live. So there's a competition for resources then more are going to survive and the ones that survive and reproduce will pass on those traits to those off to their offspring, right? So let's go back again to part one. Variation exists naturally in populations, okay? And so without variation, we couldn't have evolution because nothing would ever change if there was no variation. So we're going to now focus a little bit more on variation and where it comes from. Most of the variation that we see amongst individuals is due to genetics, due to genes, okay? Which hopefully shouldn't be a big surprise to you, right? So literally just differences in the ATCG order in the nuclear, in the DNA sequence in those genes is what causes, you know, blue eyes versus brown eyes versus green eyes versus hazel eyes versus all that stuff, right? Um, and so we get these sources, these different genetic variations from mutations. We can get them from kind of genes switching position, which we'll talk about. We get that through sexual reproduction and we get it through fast reproduction. And I'm going to go through each one of those individually. Okay. Mutations. So as we know, when DNA synthesis happens, like there are some proofreading enzymes that are coming through trying to check to make sure it's going okay. But every once in a while a mismatch gets in, right? And so about one in a hundred million gets in. And so that mutation leads to variation and we think a mutation is bad, but it's not always bad. Sometimes that mutation leads to a new color and who knows that new color could be beneficial or sometimes that mutation could lead to sickle cell, which by and of itself isn't, is not very good. But if you remember, if you're heterozygous for sickle cell and you live in Africa, then you're more likely to survive. So again, mutation could be good, could be bad, could be neutral, especially if that mutation occurs in a non-coding part of the genome, right? Then that's not really going to have any effect. Um, so altering gene number position, this is kind of interesting. Um, there are these things called jumping genes, okay? And basically they were discovered by Barbara McClintock in corn. And what she found is there's these things called transposons. And these transposons will go from one chromosome and will jump to a different chromosome or a different part of the chromosome. And they will completely just jump, but it doesn't end up messing up the chromosome so much that it's, that it doesn't work anymore. It just means it changed places. So sometimes it can, it can affect it. Sometimes it can't. So see now how this gene is like cut in half. Um, but depending on where this transposon moves to, it could disrupt a gene or it could not disrupt a gene. Um, and so having these transposons jump and duplicate themselves and all kinds of things can actually um, lead to lots of new variation. One example is that we used to have one gene for like smelling different smells, but because that gene was duplicated so many times, now we have like 380 smell genes. Okay. So again, that's really helpful to us now so that we can differentiate between different smells. So again, doesn't always, it's not always harmful, but often harmful, but this is a source of variation. Um, we've talked about this in our last unit or the unit before, whatever it was, um, how crossing over with meiosis leads to new gametes, how, um, gametes independently assorting, um, how the big B and little B don't necessarily travel together, right? That leads to variation and how different, um, orientations of metaphase can lead to different gametes. All of these are a big source of genetic variation. 
Um, also the fact that we are reproducing or things that we produce sexually. Um, so you've got all of the variation that could happen in one egg and all the variation that can happen in one sperm and combining those two together. And actually, if you crunch the number, if you can have two to the 23rd different combinations in a sperm and two to 23rd different combinations in an egg. So if you put that together, that's 70 trillion different gamete combinations, right? So that's going to lead to lots and lots of diversity in a population because again, even with siblings, they're going to have a very different combination of what they get in their particular egg or sperm. Another thing that can really contribute to genetic variation is things that produce, reproduce really fast. Now that's not us. Okay. We produce very, very slowly. We have to be a certain age before we can reproduce. Right. But certain yeah. things like viruses or bacteria, they can reproduce in hours or days. And so you can get multiple generations happening in a day or a week. And so when you get this many generations all in a row, you can see it happening really fast, right? So for example, like HIV, um, it takes two days to replicate for the next generation and HIV is RNA based. So there's no proofreading. And so there's lots and lots of mutation just because of errors and, and, um, you know, like copying of your genetic material. And so it is continually changing and evolving, which is why we don't have a cure for it yet. Okay. So those are all some sources to, uh, variation. Okay. So obviously most of them are genetic. Every once in a while, you'll see some environmental sources of variation. Um, and so these two caterpillars are the exact same species, exact same genetics, but this one ate oak flowers and this one ate oak leaves because they were raised around oak flowers. They, um, it's pretty cool that they were able to camouflage themselves with oak flowers just based off of where they lived. This one obviously looks like a little twig here because they live more on the leaves, but the exact same genes. Now this is very, very uncommon. Most of our variation comes from genetic stuff, but you can get it environmentally too. Okay. So we've got some variation and we know that populations evolve, not individuals, so how can we actually tell if evolution is happening? We've got to have a way to prove it. We just can't say it just cause, right? We have to have some way to tell. And so in order to tell, we have to look at the gene pool. Okay. And um, really what we're looking at is we're looking at the different alleles. We want to figure out what alleles are present. So we're going to go back to one of our like earlier things we talked about. They're going to be red flowers, pink flowers, or white flowers. Remember this is incomplete dominance, right? And so if there are 500 red flowers and 250, sorry, there's 500 flowers, 250 red, 150 white, and 100 pink, um, we can figure out the frequency of these alleles. Basically, how many big R's are there and how many little R's are there? So let's do the math. All the reds are both double big R, so they have two. And there's 250 red, so 250 times two is 500, okay? But our pink flowers, each pink flower has one big R. We have to count them in our, in our count too. So there's a hundred more from the pink because there are a hundred pink flowers. Each one has one. So 100 plus five, and that gives us 600 big R's. All of the whites are little R, little R, and there are 150 white. So we have 150 times two, which gives us 300 plus again, each one of these 100 pinks also has a little r. So we're going to add another 100 to that, which is going to give us 400. So our allele frequency is out of the 1,000 alleles, because each flower has two, 500 times two is 1,000. So out of them, 600 are big r's and 400 are little r's. So once we do that, we get about 0.6 and 0.4, or 60%, 40%, big r, little r. Okay. Okay, great. So how does that tell me if evolution is happening? Well, that doesn't, but if I were to look at future generations of flowers and if those future generations of flowers didn't have like 60, 40, then we could tell that evolution is occurring, right? Okay. Because if we see a shift, then we can say, oh, this population is changing. So we're going to be doing some math. I know. Yes, math. Um, and it's going to be called the Hardy Weinberg equation, which we're going to be doing in our next lecture. But so we're going to do some math to help us crunch those numbers to figure out, um, if the change is a small change or a big change or how to figure out some of that stuff to figure out if the population is, ev is evolving or if it's just kind of chilling where it is. Uh, here are the main points of things we covered in this lecture. And here's where we are in the textbook.